that that would be great. We're going to be up on our feet quite a bit. So it would be wonderful for you to put your items uh, back and away. And if you want to pull in some more chairs, you can pull some more chairs in from here, I think. small and medium parts in film and television. And uh, just kind of open the floor for a moment to some observations and uh, you know, be as honest as you can about uh, what you notice about the characterization elements of the working scene. You've got to see it. Observe. Um, he did good voice work. Good voice work. Good. They were uh, very clear and immediate characters. Very clear and immediate. You, you just knew right away who this exactly. guy was. Specific choices. Specific choices. Piggybacking on that comment. Good. Good. Those are all good things, aren't they? We want them really. Before we can even talk about characterization, how to achieve it, we really under, need to understand what it is. What is characterization? Any thoughts on that? Um, so you need to build tensions that aren't your own. Okay, you need to build tensions that aren't your own. In order to create that character. In order to create the character. Other thoughts on what characterization is? Yes? We can also decide which someone's inner, um, either emotions or uh, psych, um, the, their thoughts and their objectives become physically or outwardly manifested. Let's, let's say that again. Okay. okay. The process by which someone's, um, someone's character or someone's um, persona becomes physically manifested, either vocally, physically, um, initially. Excellent, excellent. So it's now we're talking, we're not talking about the feeling life of the character, are we? Because there's just, you know, a handful of basic emotions, right? So it's not whether the character is feeling happy or sad, angry, scared, nervous, etc. It's how the character physiologically, vocally, and energetically expresses that. It's not whether the character wants to X, Y, or Z, because you know what? There's really only a pretty primal set of basic objectives, too, that everybody's sharing. It's how the character moves their body, their voice, their energy field in pursuit of that objective. So to really experience what a character is, we want to know what our own character, our own characterization is. How do I express myself? In order to really understand how I express myself, I could take all the techniques we're going to talk about today and apply them to myself, try to identify how I relate or associate with these particular elements that we're going to talk about. Before we do that, however, we want to think of ourselves as artists, as painters perhaps. And if I were going to paint a wonderful painting, it probably be a lot more visible if I painted it here than on the board right now. True? Yes. If I tried to paint a, a painting on that board right now, it would be pretty confusing. What is the message that I'm trying to send here? Why would it be confusing? Because there's already a bunch of stuff on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, we already have a bunch of stuff on us. <laughs> when we go 
to create our character, we put things and try to make our character be a certain thing. However, a lot of times we're put, trying to put it on something that's already got a bunch of stuff on it. So we want to be able to understand what we could call is an ideal artistic neutral. An ideal artistic neutral. Okay? Or a word that I'm beginning to favor over my previous frequent use of neutral, universal. Okay? I'm liking that a little bit these days. So, in order to uh, begin to experience that, come on up on your feet and see if you can find enough space to be able to just uh, have your arms uh, to really kind of fill in the space with the exception of the bend where the camera is. So, right behind you, there, you can keep a little, little column here that the camera can see. See the camera back there? Yeah. Good. Good. Fill in all, all, all these other spaces, but it gives us a little bit of area so the camera can see. That'd be great. And, and don't be shy. The, you know, the wood, the mud, it's all good. I just want, really want to be able to do that. All right? Okay, so first thing we're going to do is I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to respond to what I say with the words, I am. And I would like for you to point to yourself when you say, I am. Okay? And I want you to just say, I am, with the fullest commitment, regardless of whether you believe <coughs> this statement or not. All right? Just full commitment. You're going to say, I am, and point to yourself. Right? <coughs> Who is a wonderful creative artist? I am. Good. Now hold where you pointed. Good. A little alley for the camera there. Good. Okay. So look around the room and tell me what you notice now. Is what are you noticing about where people have pointed? Everyone's pointing to their chest. Their chest. So it's not exactly the heart. Sometimes it's a little bit higher. You can relax now. There is a point in the body that Michael Chekhov calls the ideal artistic center. It's not really on the surface, it's within you. It is said to be approximately three inches below this collarbone point and three inches inside. Or you can kind of think of it as halfway between. If you're familiar with chakras, it's not the heart chakra. It's a little higher than that. It's a different entity, okay? You can use shark chakras and things like that for some of the, of the work that we'll be doing. However, this is distinctly different. It is a point in the self, in the physiological body, that seems to hold the essence of the I am, or the me, who me, this is my, hey, I, I call dibs on that, right? I, me, this, that's mine. Somewhere in this part of the body seems to be this I am point, okay? And Mr. Chekhov calls this the higher ego. This is the part of you that steps above all other things and is able to see the connection and the union of everything. It's able to control the peak performance for you, okay? You could say that when you turn yourself over to the power source within you that is here, you are in a peak performance. You're in a zone. Just everything becomes effortless, easy. You're kind of hanging out watching it happen. You know, you're like, you're like, damn, I'm good. That's so cool. You're out in the audience going, look, <laughs> And you, you often don't remember very much of it because the body goes into an incredible, a uh, biological condition that it experiences at no other time besides peak performance, where your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous systems, which normally work like a thermometer, either going up or down, one says, you better jazz your energy up to get safe. You know, you need more energy to fight or flee. And the other says, calm down, the coast is clear, relax. And it either goes up or it comes down. And when you're in peak performance, it actually splits. 
parts of your brain shut down to levels below what they're at when you are sound asleep. So in some cases, you're more likely to recall a dream than you are one of your peak performances because one of the parts of the brain that shuts down a short-term memory. So it's this split in this energy field and in the biology in your body that creates this uh, incredible sensation of you being able to almost watch yourself. And you are feeling like the big whoop de doo and your body's doing ah, 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 or whatever the character is doing. We would like to imagine that we can move into this incredible space. It's like the power of the sun and that we can actually use that as the point of stimulation for all of our movement and all of our action. So to try to experience this, I'd like you to imagine that you have a little powerful sun in there and that it is able to shoot out of your arm, into your arm, a spark of light that sends your arm out. And then it just falls away. So go ahead and try that several times. Try it with one arm. You could try it with your eyes closed if, you, if it helps you imagine more powerfully. And check to see if you're moving your head before your arm, which might mean that the impulse is coming from your head down there and out. Right? We'd like to get the head dissociated from it, so that it, the impulse just comes straight from that ideal artistic center and moves out. And now see if you can maybe take two arms and let them. And you may notice, oh gosh, I anticipated that one, or <coughs> that one felt different. You might notice one just feels more effortless. It, you might have some that seem to be it, and you, you might have no clue what I'm talking about. And that's fine. That's fine. Just imagine that it's possible to take your brain out of this process and have a spark of light emanate straight from that ideal artistic center, straight through and move your body. Now let's start to add a leg. A leg. See if you can just let, imagining, again, there's no hips, there's no spine, it's just the center power of light that sends energy straight into your leg and it makes it move. Almost like you have nothing to do with it, and the energy does it all by itself. And as you do this, start to take it into a walk. It'll look a little weird in the beginning, that's fine. Start to lessen the size of it and bring it into a, a walk, a more natural walk. We will walk in a circle, kind of to the right. And imagine that your ideal artistic center leads you. If you feel your head extended, maybe you can. Bring it back over your spine a little. Imagine maybe a string attached to that part. Imagine that you can open your eyes with it and look at eye level. Let those shoulders rotate and counterbalance as we normally would so you're not in a zombie position. A larger circle, two or three rows deep, and pick up the pace a little bit so that it is a little more normal pace of walk. Check where your gaze is. Are you down? If you're down, try to bring your eyes up and see how that affects the center. Let your shoulders rotate. If you have a hat on, you may want to remove it. It might be easier for you to experience uh, universality without a hat. And 
And now we'd like you again check your base, check to see where you're focusing. Let me stand for a moment. And I'm gonna, just going to make some adjustments for you. You really want to let that head come over the chest, the thumb in the ideal universal neutral should fall against the pant seam. So. If, if I adjust you and you can feel your body seeming uh, a little uncomfortable in, in this position, you know that these are your personal characterization elements. speak right out of this as if your sound voice box sound production were right out there and like you to repeat after me. I am a creative artist. I am a creative artist. I have the ability to radiate. I have the ability to radiate. Lifting my arms above me, I soar above the earth. Lifting my arms above me, I soar above the earth. Lowering my arms, I continue to soar. Lowering my arms, I continue to soar. In the air moving around my head and shoulders. In the air moving around my head and shoulders. I experience the power of thought. I experience the power of thought. In the air moving around my chest. In the air moving around my I experience the power of feelings. I experience the power of feelings. In the air moving around my feet. In the air moving around my feet. I experience the power of will. I experience the power of will. I am that I am. I am that I am. Now, what I'd like you to do once again is go back to trying to feel the energy emanate from that ideal artistic center and shoot into your arms and just let them move in some direction that won't hurt anybody in your cell. This ideal artistic center and what we just did, which is called the Actors March, is something that Mr. Chekhov worked on every day with his actors when he had his actors in a full three-year training program. Back in the 1930s. Pretty amazing. This is the state that you can come to before you begin to act, to clear yourself, to bring yourself to your highest degree of universal self to clear the canvas and then to be able to put on your character. Whenever you're working with the techniques, we have what I call three levels of concentration or attention. One is hang time, so slip into hang time. I think this is a Lisa Dalton. 
thank you. Check out Diddy said, hey, um, <laughs> I call it hang out. It's like when we're hanging out, we're talking, you're getting in directions, whatever, we're hanging out. Then there's the state of readiness. And that's when you move into this ideal artistic, neutral, universal self. And then there's the action, okay, whatever it is that's going to come next from this point. All right? So the first technique we're going to really look at is movable centers. And this technique is more popular, it's more well known than any of other uh, of Michael Chekhov's techniques. It's filtered into more different areas of training, especially into improv and things like that, where it's particularly great. So this is a movable center. Our ideal center is so free of conflict that it would be bore or boring to act from. All right? Your characters would be boring, even if you were playing God, a patron saint, whoever, the greatest guru, if you play straight out of this ideal artistic center, it would be free of conflict. And conflict is what? Drama. Yeah, and comedy. <laughs> it's the basis of our storytelling. And we are storytellers. So we can actually move our center, which really is another word for awareness, to another place. We can change the quality of it, and we can change the degree of mobility. Does it move, or is it stationary, or how does it move? Is there motion involved in it? Those three things, location, quality, and degree of mobility, connected to an imaginary center, a body center, a movable center. It's all known by these names. Okay? So like a little Pac-Man or something, we're just going like, to move this over to our right eyebrow. We're going to change it from like this golden light to what? So that's my location. I'm changing from here to here. That's my location. A quality. Give me a quality. Um, Intelligence. Okay. Intelligent. And do, is there any motion in it? Or is it just like... Suspicion. Okay. That's, that's another quality. Um, so let's say that for maybe the next one. Uh, is, does it, is it just there? Does it shoot energy out of it? Does it... Anything like that? Maybe a rattling around. Rattling. We'll take that. Rattling intelligence <laughs> in the right eye. Now, there's no rights and wrongs on this. And to begin with, I want you to way ham it up. To way overact it. Like there's something, a string attached to your right eyebrow, and there's rattling intelligence right in there, and it leads you around the room. You don't have to go in a circle. You can go wherever you want. Your voice comes out of there. Your impulse to move comes out of there. If you want to go into some line of dialogue, try a line of dialogue. Make sure it comes right out of there, whatever that voice is that seems to live in your rattly right eyebrow. Your intelligent rattly right eyebrow. <laughs> go ahead and try it. Just move it right over. Lock it in. The exaggerator. Oh, right in the whole body. How does that rattle right eyebrow affect your foot? How does it affect your butt? How does it affect your hands? Go ahead and add the line of dialogue right out of it. Remember what they were? Triplicity. Triplicity. Polarity. Polarity. Transformation. Yes. TPT. 
Triplicity, things come in threes. Polarity, opposites. Transformation, the law of change. If you have three things, beginning, middle, and end, and they are opposite, there's an opposite somewhere in there, a contrast, big contrast in there, then you will have transformation. So that's great. Characterization is one of the more powerful transformative tools for you. And it really transforms you into the character and can do so very, very rapidly. As you're practicing, you want to use this polarity, this idea of polarity. So let's find a polar place where it would be a more, a, a, someplace pretty opposite from the right eyebrow. Left toe. Left toe. And we were going to do suspicion, weren't we? Yeah. Let's do suspicious left toe. And does it have a degree of mobility? It flickers like a flame. It flickers like a flame. Good. A flickering, suspicious left big toe? Big toe. <laughs> there you go. Okay, and again, start it very exaggerated so you can really feel how that impulse coming from there and your voice is now coming from your, your suspicious, flickering left big toe. How does that affect head through? It's like instead of a bright shining light, there's a veil over it, softening it, soft drape, making the light, making it more subtle. Go ahead and let it influence the voice just as much. And keep the voice unveiled, but the body veiled. <laughs> monologue or something like that, you can use letters of the alphabet or numbers. It really is not, uh, <coughs> you know, incredibly important that you get your dialogue correct. We would like to see how these different elements of characterization change the dialogue. Did you notice some difference between how you said your dialogue yes. with the right up here, with the down there, right? Very different. Let's go to one more, and this one is going to be outside of the body. Actually, I want you to, without letting the person know it, I want you to select another person in the room. And you're going to put your center into them. You're going to pick a part of their body where your center is located in part of their body. Just go ahead and say the body part, kind of mumble it out loud. Okay. Now, you're going to give it a quality that is not a feeling. It is a, uh, it's a, a state. It's a, a state of nature. It's a thunderstorm. It's a rainbow. It's a, a golden pond. It's a, it's a state of nature. It's an earthquake. It's an ice storm. It's a snow, snow, snowflake, snow, whatever. It's, 
it has the degree of mobility of whatever that state or condition is. Okay. I want you to walk around the room without getting closer than 10 feet to your center. Yearning to connect with your center. Quality, let the quality of it affect how you're walking. That innate state of nature is somehow influencing you. You can make it very exaggerated to begin with, so it's unveiled for you to get into the body. And then when you feel that, then you can start to veil it, make it subtler. Don't let it fade. Veiling is not fading. We do not turn the energy down when we veil. We simply contain the energy. Go ahead and add some dialogue. Let yourself vocalize that. Imagine your voice is coming out again. Oh, unless you can stop. <laughs> is about the how. Right? It's not that you're tying your shoe, it's not that you're walking, it's how you're tying your shoe and <coughs> how you're walking and how you're speaking and how you're expressing. So characterization is about the how. Yes? I think what's interesting is if you change the center from which the energy is coming, it kind of subconsciously changes everything else about you. It changes your voice, the yeah. quality of your voice almost instantly. It's not something you have to think about. Um, it changes where you, obviously, well, of course, where you're holding your center, but it changes like the physicality and how you're feeling. Yes, yes. So that's the wonderful thing about it. Through this one point of concentration, you get this transformation that will come to you each and every time you put your focal point on that center. It will be consistent for you. And yet, you are concentrating on that center now. That flicker, no flame flickers the same, does it? No flicker is ever the same. So it's not that you're repeating what that center brought to you. That center is there now. So that degree of mobility, whether it's fixed, whether it's shaking, whatever it is, is is an effervescent kind of thing. It's always some kind of living moment in the moment. Very, very exciting. Uh, Helen Hunt, who got her Oscar for what? As, as yes. yes, she played a waitress. She's, you know, she's a professional actress all her life. She never waited tables. She never did anything besides act. And so she couldn't connect. So she put her feet, she made her feet her center. And she gave herself tired feet. And that gave her her character. Clint Eastwood uses centers a lot. I'm not exactly sure what they are, but one of our mutual teachers, George Stanoff, who's featured in the um, From Russia to Hollywood documentary, told me, and I think this is, uh, uh, and then, Clint Eastwood's biographer told me, Clint uses centers because he's very shy. And he doesn't want to reveal his personal self to the world. So by using a center, he can reveal the character through that. I imagine he uses powerful centers a lot up here, or you know, points like that. 
Um, <coughs> George Donoff, who, who uh, also coached uh, Clint, um, told me that a lot of actors are afraid that the audience will see parts of them that they have shame about. And that if they perform a certain way, sexually or powerfully or victimly or something like that, that the audience might see their own victimhood or their own sexuality or their own shame or something like that. And, uh, and what is really important to understand is that the audience can see only what you reveal to them and you reveal to them through your motion, your movement, and your sound. So Dr. Bird whistles basis of perception, who knows this. How much of the information a human being takes in is through the visual? What? 55. 55. How much through tone? 38. Right. And 7% is what we're saying, the script. Okay. So, unless you reveal it through tone and through your body and through what you choose, the words you actually choose to speak, they can't see it. Someone like Clint was able to use, to help convince himself that he was able to use centers to feel safe, to feel secure and powerful. If you're doing a series or something like that, you have a center, it's the center of the character, and it kind of just stays there. You could have a secondary one, you could have a temporary one. You know these sayings we have, like, my heart threw into my float, and, uh, that was good. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> my heart flew into my throat. Can you see that? As, as a center change, just think of that. Think of where your heart is, and just for a moment, let the center fly into your throat. So if you had to do this moment of surprise night after night after night to try and give it some truth, a feeling of truth, you might use that as an image. Or your center can drop or fall. Anybody ever see the um, La Caja Fall birdcage? When, when he reads the letter that she's not coming to the party, you can see him, you know, a good actor doing it, will there, one could imagine you could just have that center as you read the letter, just drop, 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 drop. all the way down. It would be very powerful. So you can use these for a temporary <coughs> little effect or as a great element of characterization. And for improv, it's just fantastic because you can just snap. And if you use that TPT, the loss of polarity and triplicity and stuff like that, you will get, you'll make very, very different kinds of characters. The center can be in you, around you. The quality can be anything. You can have qualities based on animals, based on textures, based on architecture, based on nature, anything. Okay, that's why I wanted us to do this you know, nature element thing, just to get an idea of what different way to use it. So now what I'd like us to do is I'd like you to stand up and uh, if you can, create a uh, space where you can just rotate your arms. Alright, now I'd like you to imagine that you can actually feel a force field around you, sometimes known as an aura. <coughs> and that you can define this aura. This is a bubble of air that you carry with you everywhere you go. Right now, almost everybody's is on, on bordering or overlapping somebody else's. People who are sitting close to somebody, completely <laughs> overlapping, right? Just for a moment, walk around, imagine you're carrying this force field with you. And you're physicalizing it. Go ahead and keep that, your hands out. So you see, whenever your hands kind of overlap with somebody else's, you feel your force field overlapping. 
walk, uh, you don't need to walk in a circle, you can walk in any direction. If you're tending to pull your arms in, it is actually possible for the human being, of course they can photograph these force fields now, and if you tend to pull your energy in, you may find yourself getting claustrophobic. If you tend to feel your arms pulling in, it's a protective mechanism. You don't want to get hurt. In this case, it may be just physical. I don't want my arms bumped. But that is revealing what is invisible. Go ahead and relax for a moment, kind of in hang time. Each of us carries this what Mr. Chekhov calls a personal air about us, a personal atmosphere. So he has what is known as an overall atmosphere. That's the vibe in the space. The energy in the space is a result of what the space is made of and what's happening in the space. This is a personal atmosphere. This is an air about you. You have the right to say that. So and so -and -so has an air. What kind of airs do we comment on? Uh, like a snobby air. A friendly air. A friendly air. <coughs> a depressed air. Oh, angry. Angry. Shy. Intellectual air. Intellectual. Confused. Confused, yes. Confident. Suspicious. Suspicious. Yeah, malicious. Serious. Malicious. Natural. Nice words, guys. Okay. Good choices. <laughs> aloof. Aloof. Yes. So they're not moods. And that's really important, that a personal atmosphere is not a mood. These friendly airs, are, they kind of live with the person. These suspicious airs, these malicious airs, they just kind of live with the person. They go everywhere they go. You know, um, oh, Pig Pen. <laughs> right? He's got this little air of pile of dirt over him. And wherever Pig Pen goes, there goes his dirt, right? <laughs> and so he has this air of dirtiness about him. It, it doesn't matter if he's happy, it doesn't matter if he's sad, he has dirtiness there. And so this is like a personal atmosphere. Your character has a personal atmosphere in the same way that you have a personal atmosphere, right? So if you don't understand what your personal atmosphere is and you try to create the character's personal atmosphere, let's say that your personal atmosphere is very sweet and your character's personal atmosphere is very sweet. If you try to put on sweet on top of sweet, what will happen? A cavity. <laughs> yes, we're going to get too much sugar, aren't we? And it's like putting crystallized sugar on top of powdered sugar on top of a chocolate covered strawberry that's really ripe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and advantageous. <laughs> right? So we really do want to know because if, if we have an air of snobbiness, and, uh, and even though we don't think we're snobby, we just may have had very tall parents, you know, and may have grown up looking up. <laughs> you know, and so people may think that we're, we're aloof or snobby when we just, you know, our bone structure grew this way. So we need to know what our form and our energy field puts out into the world so that we can compare it to our characters. What is the same, what we find the same between ourselves and our characters, we want to make note of. And what is different is what we want to pay attention to and play. So what is the same, effectively ain't broke. So if you're friendly, the character's friendly, don't focus on the tool of personal atmosphere. If your character center is in their forehead and yours is in their forehead, don't focus on putting in your forehead, overact. But if it's in your forehead and yours is intelligent and his is retarded, then yeah, change the quality. You won't have to work on the location, you'll need to work on the quality. So you want to be able to know who you are. Where is your center? What is your personal atmosphere? Now let's put on 
and imagine for our purposes that we're going to take this, uh, what, what do you say, superiority? Snobby. Snobby. Okay? And what I'd like you to do is, uh, is I'd like you to do a gesture that is a snobby gesture. Like, oh, if you were really ham acting and you were going to be snobby, what would the movement be? <laughs> so it's an action. A, a gesture is a movement with an intention. So it's not a mannerism. All right? So it, it has a, an intention. What does a snobby person do to other people? Okay? Puts them down. Okay, so dismiss. So movements that put down or dismiss. Do a movement that puts down or dismiss. Make it an action. Give it a beginning, middle, and end. So, so it's too subtle right now. Make it more obvious. Overact it. Make it very obvious. Good. And do that gesture a gazillion times in this field around you. So you can repeat this gesture. Fill it. Fill it. Specifically, really do the gestures. Put it above you, put it in the air below you, behind you. Now, leave the gesture of that in this bubble and walk around with the bubble. You don't have to do the gesture. You just are surrounded and filled and carrying the air of this. And go ahead and let your line of dialogue dismiss itself from your body. And just for a moment, hold that energy, hold your posture. Now, how does this air of snobbishness when you when you're standing still and hanging out? How does it affect your body? How do you stand because of it? It's better yeah. posture. Good. Really let your body hold that snobbishness in it. Remember from that DVD how powerfully you could instantly pick up what was going on? Now I'd like you to switch it to an air of victim. An air of victim. What does a victim do? Protect themselves. Protect themselves. So build into the air that protection with some movement and gesture. Right? So make it bigger than just your body. Pull it into the air. And now we'll carry that air of victimness, that personal atmosphere of victimness. Okay. And say some of the same dialogue. Remember, it has to be loud enough to be heard by your audience. You must carry the air of victim. <laughs> Joints touching other joints? 
Yeah, knuckles on knuckles, knuckles on hips, elbows on wrists. There, at the finger, head leading. There, okay. When the human being, you go ahead and relax. When the human being is dominated by their thoughts, their center tends to move up. If you were trying to, the shoulders tend to knit, the eyebrows tend to knit, right? Active finger, tip. Some, anybody rock up on your toes at all or wiggle your toes at all? Possibly. Joints tend to touch joints. And if you're talking, you tend to emphasize letters which are made off the top of your mouth with air. Fricatives and plosives. So a thinking dominated person is going to talk hitting those plosives and those fricatives. And they're going to use their fingers, they're going to gesture higher and their pattern of movement is tending to be direct, straight. Joints touching joints. Yes? So let's exaggerate that <coughs> and take your line of dialogue. You can walk in straight lines, lead with your head. You can take your, like your head, head. It's almost, a, the D is almost a T. Head. Right? Lead with your head. Exaggerate that. And the melody is flat, monotone. The element is air. Okay? Airhead. Thoughts fly in and out. Yes? Yes? So, air. Listen. A thinking dominated person might say something like, listen. Because the sound is carried by the air. So you'll hear hearing bass. Let me hear your thoughts. Okay, so the language choices, how the words are spoken, everything. I would like you to do a little activity, whether it's bending down and tying your shoe, walking over and getting a, a, a pretend piece of thumbs being exposed, a lot of curves going on. Right? And much more melody in your language. A greater emphasis on your vowels. This, these are all the tendencies in the human being that occur when we are preoccupied and being driven by our emotional states, our feeling states. The middles of things. Anyone feel your cheeks a little, you know, rosier at the moment? Your eyes a little bit sparklier. From your, from like the eyebrows, remember they're thinking. Hmm. The eyebrows are kind of like the shoulders of the face. <laughs> there. The, from the under the eyebrows to the upper lip, the feeling. From under the collarbone to your gut, the feeling. From in the middle of your hand and the middle finger. So take your middle finger, just draw it along. Take your index finger, thinking finger, and see is it different in the sensitivity level? Go back to the feeling finger. Go to the inside of your arm. Touch the elbow, outside the arm. Different levels of sensitivity. Take your index finger across your eyebrows and your forehead. Bring your middle finger under your eyes. See, and we, we do that, don't we? We often use that middle finger. So you can take the same line of dialogue that you had before and emphasize lots of melody and vowels and curve. You can do the same action. Pick up that same bottle of water in the middle instead of at the top in a curve. When you're talking, you hold it in the middle of your body instead of up at the top. You expose palms, you expose insides, arms. And try that for a moment. Walk in curves, approach in curves, your little activity with the curve. See how it's different? Say your dialogue with the curving letters. <laughs> Thank you.
courage. Uh, which comes from the will force. An expression of love of the will force. Okay, take away everything that's curved. Make yourself very straight. And if you're in the Wizard of Oz, who are you? <laughs> and what do you want? A heart, which will bring you your curves, won't it? And if you take away everything that's straight, who are you? And what do you want? The thinking forces that will bring you that straightness. And what is the scarecrow made of? Which is very straight, isn't it? And what shape is every piece of tin on the Tin Man? Circular, curved. And what is the lion half giant of? Paws and a tail, right? And what does the wizard tell them? They've had it all along, yes. And what does Dorothy want? And what does she have to do to go home? Click her heels, where her will force is, how many times? Three. Yay! Three, isn't that amazing? And if we think of the primary centers for the will here, for the feeling in here, and for the thinking up here, the merging point of that is what? The ideal artistic center. So this thinking, feeling, and willing force creates the trinity of the psychology. We all have thinking forces, we all have feeling forces, we all have will forces. Which one controls us at any given moment? It's going to alter our movement. And every character has a predomination. So every character will tend to be more angular or more curvy or more straight. Every character will tend to operate more out of the upper, the middle, or the lower body. Every character will operate more out of the heel of the foot, the arch of the foot, or the toes of the feet. Or out of the heel of their hand, the palm of their hand, or the tips of their foot, or their groin, or their belly, or their shoulder. Okay? or their forehead, their cheeks and eyes, or their jaw. Do you see, start to see this? That means that every single motion you make, no matter how tightly directed you are, if I am directed to move here, step across this, and step back across it to there, I can do it in some angles, and I can curve my way through it. I can be very linear with it. Okay. Every single motion, and for will force, it's the earth, right? Talk about being grounded. And so it's all the sounds that come off the lower jaw. Gut, duh, ruh, judge. There, try line of dialogue. Give yourself strong will force. Stick the chin out, over exaggerate. Put your heels down, and go ahead and say your line. Go. I know. <laughs> Good. Got the feel of it? See how different that is. Every single character is a combination of all three. And so switching from one to the other at just the perfect moment. Anybody see Forrest Gump? Thinking dominated. Everything he did was run in squares and straights and chocolates like this, and, and it was all his, his mental capability, wasn't it? In the end, when he was worried about his son and whether he has any smarts, he he turns his head, I don't remember if it's this way or that way, he turns his head, and he keeps his head tilted the rest of the time <laughs> when he goes into that tilt. And Jenny, she's all this, isn't she? And almost all the scenes of Jenny, Jenny have water. They're on a bridge when she's arguing after singing. It's raining when they make love. It's a reflecting pool. Where she's filled with liquid and drugs and stuff like that. All very watery. And Lieutenant Dan had a very strong, well-balanced will force, didn't he? Until it was blown off of him, wasn't it? And then he's wallowing in a sea of self-pity in a wheelchair with a lot of watery alcohol until he gets onto the boat named Jenny and he finally gets the spirit of you know lightning struck into him and it brings him to a point of balance where he gets prosthetic legs he gets susan a wife he brings himself back into this nice ideal center again 
Sally Fields Forrest, what does she do in order to get him into school? <laughs> yeah, because she doesn't care what anybody thinks, she doesn't care what anybody feels, she wants what she wants, and stupid is as stupid does, does, you see. So I'm not saying that the people who wrote The Wizard of Oz knew about thinking, feeling, willing, or the people who wrote Forrest Gump knew about that. What I am suggesting is it's universal. It's universal. You can find elements of this in all belief systems, from Hindu, Christianity, Judaism, all over the place, Greek, Roman. These ideas are there. And we're just picking up on what's there, getting an understanding of how it makes each one of us unique and different. And then being able to understand how the physical body and the vocal expression can be altered consciously to create the kind of transformation that you're looking for. Okay? Well, one more big tool is called the imaginary body. I'd like you to find a space where you can sense um, that, that personal atmosphere we talked about, that you have your own. In your imagination, there's an empty bubble in front of you. One that has no character in it yet. I would imagine that you can you can go into the highest world of imagination, that this ideal artistic center within you is able to create a force field of light that goes straight up through your head. It goes right up through the roof. Picture this with me as I describe it. This incredible force field goes right up through the roof, through the Earth's ozone layer, and bursts into a sphere of imagination where all characters live. Nemo's living up there, right beside Hamlet. Right? Antigone's up there. Past, present, future, real, <coughs> cartoon, doesn't matter. All the characters live up in this sphere of imagination. And like on Star Trek, you're just going to beam a picture of this character down. And I'm going to ask you to invite, <coughs> when you're up there, I'd like you to look around and invite your character from the piece that you've been working on to appear before you. Just mentally think that. Will you please come down and show me who you are? Okay. If you don't have a character, then pick a random character. And I'm going to ask a series of questions and want you to imagine they're coming down now and the feet start to appear. What do the feet look like? And you just see that. Look at that body forming in front of you. Or if you feel it coming onto you, that's okay too. What are the feet like? And what are the legs like? Are there shoes, socks? How old are the feet? Are there leggings or socks or <coughs> pants? What are, what, are the thigh, what are the thighs look like? What do the sex organs look like? What is the buttocks, the, the hips, the belly button, any outie, what is it? Is there underwear, the pants, dress, skirt, clothes? The belly, the chest, the breasts? How big, what size? The shoulders? Is there something covering? Is there are there undergarments? Are there shirts? Are there coats? The neck? What kind of neck? What kind of head? Is it big? Is it small? What color is the skin? The jaw? Is it strong? Weak? Well defined? The lips? What are they shaped like? The teeth? What condition are they in? What form are they in? The cheeks? The nose? The eyes? The eyelashes? The eyebrows, the forehead, what about the hair, what color of hair, what, what texture, what shape, what style, is there any? Arms, the upper arms, the elbows, the lower arms, the wrists, the 
hands, fingers, fingernails? Are there any scars on the body? Any other clothing, accessories, jewelry? Is there anything else about this body, this imaginary body? Now, if, if, if it's in front of you, I'd like you to step out of your personal atmosphere and into it, literally take a step and put it on like a costume. If you're already in it, you begin to explore it. When you put it on, step into it, you can physically mine if you want, putting the legs on, pulling it up, slipping the arms on, slipping your head into it, slipping the hair on, putting the jewelry on. <coughs> Once you're inside of it, it's like you yourself are the skeleton and the imaginary body is the muscle. It's the muscle that walks you around. And to begin with, just like in the centers, let it be very strong. Let it be overacted even. Let the body move you. And when you're ready, let the body speak through its imaginary lungs, with its imaginary chest, its imaginary teeth, tongue, and mouth. Let that dialogue be strong. <coughs> no. <laughs> you don't need to say it to me. chance to come visit later. Okay? Thanks. <coughs> a lot of people are going to think I'm loony and not all Chekhov teachers are doing this. However, I've taught this for, for many, many years and used it for many years. And I can say that it is beyond uh, accident when I say that people are haunted. Uh, many great musicians and many great artists were haunted by images, whether it was in the clay or whether it was in, you know, in the ethers for the melody or whatever. Mr. Chekhov believes that these images actually exist all by themselves up there, like Hamlet's up there, and when you bring him down, he mixes with who you are, and when you bring him down, he mixes with who you are. But he's up there, he's what Shakespeare tapped into, and we can tap into anything that the writer comes up with because it's all from the same source. And your higher ideal artistic center has a direct line to that source. Okay? So you're always able to get it and restore it. You want to learn to be able to step into your character and step out of your character just like that. Like a boxer who jumps to the ready and drops it just like that when the bell rings to conserve their energy, to be most efficient. Anyone who chooses to stay in character in, at unnecessary times, meaning at lunch, 
in between rehearsals, etc., is doing for, doing that for only one reason, which is fear. Unsure of themselves. Fear that they won't be able to find the character. We do not foster an atmosphere of fear. Okay? How do you feel about acting? Love it. Love it. So we foster a feeling of love. And love means we trust. We trust our nature. We trust our talent. We trust the character will be there for us. When you have technique, you're able to be committing yourself to totally thinking, totally feeling, totally willing. You're able to shift your center, able to put these imaginary bodies off and on, then you have every reason to believe you will always be in a state of readiness to receive the character. Good? Great, go ahead and sit down. getting into your peak performance. We talked for a little bit about villain, being a villain, right? For a little bit. There are four basic archetypes of characters in most stories, in particular film and TV stories. Fortunately, fortunately in theater, sometimes we get some that maybe move in a different direction. But most storytelling will have four basic archetypes. They are the archetype of the villain, the archetype of the hero, the bystander, and the victim. Mo what I'm saying is most of your roles will fall into that. Over here, I have under characterization, I have the ideal, artistic, neutral, or universal as I prefer. And then the archetype and then the specific individual. When you can't get any feel for what your character is like, you, you want to go to the archetype. You want to find out, are they basically a villain, a victim, a hero, or a bystander? Okay? And then within that, you're going to ask yourself something like this. What's their profession? Because there is a tendency for people who have a certain profession to move, they have a certain psychology to move toward a certain profession. So what we're saying is that uh, a doctor has a certain personal atmosphere of doctorness. And there's a something that's the same about healing and caregiving as a nurse. However, doctor is hero and nurse is bystander. Can you see that? Doctor is hero and nurse is bystander. So you want to be able to understand what does your body radiate naturally. That's where you're first going to be cast. Do you radiate bystander? Do you radiate hero, villain, victim? You should be able to cover a, at least two, probably three, if not all four. Ideally, as a, as a transformational actor, you would be able to cover all four. But in your marketing and everything else, you've got to understand who you are, and you need to be able to play that really well. If you look like Susie Two-Shoes and you're a slut, you need to be able to act like Susie Two-Shoes, okay, if you want to get cast. If you look like the villain, you have to be able to play a sleaze. You cannot be a nice guy. You need to be able to activate your villainy. All right? And once you get those overall archetypes, then you can break it down into the next layer of archetypes, which often deals with profession. The thief, the accountant, the police officer, whatever it is, the teacher. You want it, you, if you don't know where to start with characters, that's where you go. Okay? If you can get them through uh, the imagination, this process of inviting them to come and visit you, Chekhov says you can have dialogues with them, all sorts of things, and you can. Uh, and sometimes you're wondering if it's really happening or if you're just making it up. Guess what? Make it up. 
Because of where do you think you're getting the information and the ideas to make it up from? Right? It's all the same place. Whether you're really seeing it, hearing it, feeling it, or whatever. I used to pretend that I was actually seeing this body. I didn't see anything. But when I would put on, put it on, I'd be like, oh no, that's not right. Oh yeah, that's what it is. I, had a, I, I wasn't like a seer in my imagination. I had kinesthetic sense or something like something different. Don't let anybody's verbiage scare you from, you know, and make you feel like maybe you're not doing it right. Any way that works is a good way that doesn't hurt you or anybody else. So we have those, those archetypes there. The trinity of the psychology, thinking, feeling, and willing. There's another thing, Rudolf Steiner, who's a very strong influence, a, a uh, philosopher from Austria, 1864 to 1925, um, influenced uh, Chekhov, and is like one half of the influence of Chekhov, uh, along with Stanislavski, created a system of movement representing sound and stuff like that. Uh, so every letter of the alphabet has a, sh a gesture to it. And every sign of the zodiac has a gesture to it, three colors that go with it, and certain letters of the alphabet that go with it. So you could, if you went in deep with this stuff, you could decide that your character is a, a, a cancer, the gesture for cancer is this, and um, the color is all of green, gold, and uh, orange accents. So you could put your wardrobe with that, and your climax, you could have more bright orange and less green. And uh, if the letters are a K, which is this gesture, and uh, uh, then your character might, might when they're standing around, might stand around like this, and when somebody comes and says something that they don't like, they might go, tch, 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 like that, right? And your character's a Libra, and the sign is like this, so the character stands around like this, right? And um, uh, the sound is uh, ah, ah. So, so when somebody comes and bothers them, they're like, ah. Instead of, so you, it, there's a gazillion things you can do, and it's really, really fun for you. In uh, one of the recommendations for headshots, if you came and see these, you can uh, come afterwards. You will see in these completely different thinking, feeling, and willing forces. You will see that the lines in the wardrobe, in the background, and in the fonts go to enhance the intelligence level, or the feeling forces, or the will forces and that the eyes themselves are radiating something specific, an action specific, to communicate something. I can say that this is by far the prettiest picture, however, it's completely generic. It's well-balanced, it's ideal artistic center Lisa. All right, it gets me many fewer auditions than this one. The victim, okay, or the bystander. So we're going to wrap this up, and anybody who wants to stay can watch my demo, and you'll see a tremendous amount of collage at the end, a tremendous array of characterizations there. And you'll see my demo is specifically geared to promote, it was geared for Hollywood, and it's to promote me primarily in these two genres, in the main part of it. And then the collage is all over the place with a, a gazillion different characters. Because in Hollywood, these are my more marketable areas. Most of the commercials that you've, you've seen me in, or TV shows or whatever, if you've caught any, are these two characters. The villain and the bystander. Okay? So I want to thank you all. I hope that you will work toward finding your ideas. So let's just do a fade first. So all I'm going to do, whatever transition it is, it's just like a scene. Just left click on it, hold it down, drag it down between the scenes. Wow. And the screen thing here, it's what's called rendering. The computer is uh, the computer's going to go through all kinds of gymnastics to make that work right. Anyway, let's see what it looks like.
Oh, I'm sorry, we put it in the wrong place. Yeah, I, I was wondering. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's okay. That's good. No, no, we're putting it in the wrong place. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna delete that.